All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Thursday, everybody. Hope all of you guys have had a great week so far. Got a jam-packed show for you today. We had a crazy Wednesday night slate. We had two 50-point games, a crazy LeBron James triple-double. A couple other guys had big-time nights. So what we're going to do, we're going to go over five great performances from Wednesday so I can bounce around those games. And then at the tail end of the show, I have 18 clips for a film session that I want to go over. Some stuff with Carl Anthony Towns and the way he's been unlocking things for the New York Knicks. I want to talk about Steph Curry's just ridiculous performance down the stretch against the Dallas Mavericks. And then at the tail end, we're going to go over some stuff with Giannis and how he's been using inverted ball screens to cause problems for opposing bigs that try to guard him. So film session at the tail end, five great performances from Wednesday off the start. And then we're out of here for the day. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss show announcements. Don't forget about our podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts under Hoops Tonight. Don't forget it's helpful if you leave a rating and a review on that front. Also, new social media feeds for the Hoops Tonight channel on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Make sure you guys head over there and follow them. Uh, so that we, when we release those reels and different content that we release, you guys can see them there. We're also tweeting out show links there every day and some show announcements as well. And then last but not least, keep dropping mailbag questions into the YouTube comments. The questions for Friday I've already chosen, um, but uh, we're going to keep doing mailbags on every Friday. And I go back through the week to find questions in the YouTube comments. So make sure you keep dropping them there for next week's mailbag. All right, let's talk some basketball. So five great performances from Wednesday. Let's start with number one, Giannis Antetokounmpo. 59 points, 14 rebounds, and seven assists. Three things that I want to uh, hit on from this particular game. First of all, posting mismatches, doing the work early in possessions to get the right guy that you're trying to attack in space. Did a lot of that with Paul Reed in the first half, right? Like just because, like, I, like one of the things we've seen with uh, a lot of teams with Giannis and this has been for a while, dating all the way back to, I remember watching a FIBA game where Nikola Jokic did a pretty good job on Giannis because like, if you give him enough space uh, to, to make those left-right slides to meet him at spots and you're strong enough to absorb contact, you can at least force him to shoot shots over the top, right? And like, we've seen teams try that. Like, let's put a big, huge athlete on him, sit further back, beat him at, beat him to spots and absorb contact. Well, <clears throat> There's no reason to do that if you don't have to, if you can get him switched off of you earlier in possessions. The second piece of it is inverted ball screens. And this is a concept I've talked a lot about on this show because it the inversion is in the defensive roles. And that is where it changes what is strengths for two players into weaknesses. So like guards that are guarding ball handlers are pretty used to getting screened. So they're good at navigating screens. They're good at seeing them coming. They're good at like, preparing for screens while also simultaneously keeping their attention on the ball handler. That's what they do for a living, right? Screen defenders, big guys, they're really good at seeing a guy coming off of a screen and being able to corral someone coming at them in those situations. But as soon as you invert that process, suddenly you have big guys that don't know how to navigate screens, that don't know how to like be aware of where screens are coming from while also being aware of the ball handler. And they can be kind of mixed up in those situations. And then a smaller guard who is going to struggle with someone coming head with a head of steam at them when they're in more of like a drop coverage situation. Or in many cases, they don't even think to help because they're usually staying glued to the screener because they're so fixed on the ball handler because that's what they've been doing since they were young basketball players. It inverts all of those roles. The main way you saw that in this game, because Giannis got both Jalen Duran and Isaiah Stewart with inverted ball screens. In those situations, you're watching Duran and uh, and Stewart looking left to right, like trying to figure out where the screen is coming from, and they're just not able to quickly process what's happening and how to react to it. And next thing you know, Giannis is zooming down them at uh, a down past them at full speed, and it's either a dunk or another easy kickout pass. Those inverted. Actions and they did it a lot with AJ Green. They did a lot with Pat Connaughton in this game. Those inverted actions just give Giannis the ability to get downhill. Again, if he's attacking Isaiah Stewart in a one on one situation, you might just give him five feet, beat him to a spot, and force him to shoot over the top. But if you're able to get him mixing up into uh, screening actions, it's more than likely that he's going to be going to be able to get more easy dribble penetration. And then the third piece of it is the hesitation jumper. <clears throat> So one of the the most interesting kind of subplots of this season, I've talked about it a few times, but one of the most interesting subplots of this season is that 
Giannis has cut way down on his three-point volume. He's taking 0.8 threes per game, which is his lowest since 2015. But he's way more effective from the mid-range this year than he's been in his entire career. And this is like the other piece of it, right? In those one-on-one situations, when the guy's giving him tons of space to try to beat him to the spot and absorb that contact in the chest, that's where Giannis can actually get into that little hesitation jumper and knock it down. And it's counterintuitive because you think, oh, it'd be better off for Giannis to work on threes because all he has to do is get to 33%, and now he's getting one point per shot. Well, here's the thing. Giannis can't make threes. That's the problem. So, like, it doesn't matter what any whatever analytical advantage you get or mathematical advantage you get from taking threes if you can't make them. It is clear that Giannis is capable. We've seen at various points through phases like 2021 where he shot free throws extremely well to this year with the mid-range. Like he's just more comfortable with his release in that 15-foot range. And so a lot, like many times last night, he had 15 points just on off the dribble jump shots last night. So he gets into that high hesitation. And again, the high hesitation, just imagine like the, it's, it kind of looks a little bit like a carry where you're like sitting in between dribbles with the ball with your hand kind of a little bit on the side, a, a little bit underneath the ball. It is a bridge move. It's a move I teach my high school kids where it's like you can go anywhere from this move. If you're in the high hesitation, you can rise into a jump shot. You can cross back over to the left. You can go between the legs to the uh, or to the right, I should say. You can go between the legs to the right. You can go behind the back to the right. You can throw an in-and-out dribble. You can go into a step-back dribble. You can launch yourself forward into a driving move, or you can just rise up into a jump shot. And so it's the they call it a hesitation move because it usually gets the defender to hesitate in a lot of cases, right? Like you're hesitating, the defender's hesitating, everyone freezes for a second, and you have an opportunity to rise up into a jump shot. And so Giannis uses it almost to set his rhythm, right? The defender is playing off of him, so it's not like Giannis needs to make some sort of move to get to a jump shot, but a lot of times having a a move anyway that you go to will help you set your rhythm. So for instance, if he just walks into a jumper, it might feel clunky and awkward, but if he's in the gym going, I took you know 100 hesitation mid-range jump shots per day the entire summer, he can ground himself mentally in a way that goes... I'm going to sit in this hesitation dribble and then rise up into this jump shot and it's going to feel like I'm in the gym by myself. And so he's actually gotten pretty damn efficient with that shot. He's shooting 49% on off the dribble jump shots, field goal percentage overall, 45% on jump shots. And he's getting 0.95 points per jump shot attempt, which is by far the best of his career. That has been a huge thing that has helped piece together a reliable over the top game for Giannis this year. He's also shooting a higher percentage of hook shots too, although he's not using them as much as I'd like. Giannis is playing some of the best basketball of his career. He's absolutely hooping his ass off. It was kind of funny last night watching Isaiah Stewart. uh, Every time Giannis would make a shot in the early part of the game, he'd throw one of those like kind of condescending waves at him. And then Giannis just kept making them. And then Isaiah Stewart had yet another characteristic, complete and total breakdown on the court as he yanks Giannis out of the sky and ends up getting a flagrant two and getting ejected. But that's Isaiah Stewart for you. Big shock. Uh, One other thing with Giannis that I thought was really impressive last night, sometimes like making simple basketball plays doesn't get the attention that it deserves. And there were a couple of big plays in this game where Giannis just hit Torian Prince on like swing passes, meaning like he's dribbling at the top of the key and Torian's guy is kind of digging down to the nail to try to help contain Giannis's drives. And Giannis just rifles a swing pass to Torian Prince right in the shooting pocket and he's able to rise up and shoot. It's not anything special. He's not running a fancy pick and roll and whipping a cross court pass or like drawing a double team and making some beautiful read. It's just simple basketball. I'm dribbling at the top of the key. This dude's digging down into the lane. If I throw this pass on time and on target, we can get a three point shot. I don't have to put wear and tear on my body. We don't have to put everybody else through all these different screening actions. Like the entire purpose of running a screening action or uh, or any sort of five man action is to try to get a closeout. Here's one that's being gift wrapped to us just by the way that they're guarding Torian Prince. Let's lean on that. Those are little things that make you a more efficient basketball player. A lot of times we think of uh, of dramatic improvement when it comes to improving as a playmaker, as a scorer, many times it's just the simple things. A lot of times improving as a scorer can be generating three, four, five additional easy looks a game just by improving your basketball instincts, getting open jumpers off of a decent relocation or running off of a screen or running in transition or getting two, three back cut layups a game just by beating over plays. Like they become better scorers by just finding more easy stuff. 
Same thing goes with playmaking. A lot of times it's like, oh, like, like a lot of the best playmakers in the world have four or five assists a game that are just easy. It's like, oh, I dribbled off this ball screen and just whipped a behind the back pass to the popping big because he's wide open every single time that you run a pick and pop against a drop coverage. Like, I don't need to do something surgical here. Let's just take the easy reads that are available in the game. And I thought that those swing passes to Torian Prince were a classic example of that last night. Bucks get two wins in a row. The Bucs are now 1.5 games back of the four seed in the Eastern Conference. This is why, with all these questions surrounding trades for the Bucs, I've kept saying the same thing. It is way too soon to bail on the season for Milwaukee. It's been a disaster, no doubt. You should feel lower on this team than you did to start the year. They haven't looked good. I'm not trying to change that. But this is not over. There is so much time left. There's a lot of different things that could go one way or another over the course of this season. Who knows what kind of trades that could be available to them, who could become available in the buyout market. Like, Who knows what this looks like in the long run. They're 1.5 games back in the four seed. And most importantly, they're starting to show more competitiveness. I'm seeing more fight out of them. Even in their last couple of losses, there's just more fight. There's fight in the Knicks game. There's fight in the Celtics game. There's just fight coming from this team. And look at their next 11 games. They have Charlotte, Houston, Chicago, Indiana, Charlotte again. Miami, Washington, Detroit, and Atlanta. It's completely reasonable to think that they could be right back in the mix of things by the end of that stretch. Second big performance from last night. Victor Wembenyama goes for 50 points, 18 for 29 from the field. All about the jump shot, right? With Victor, he had eight threes. 28 of his 50 last night came off of jump shots. Some of it's about action, right? Like the picking and popping again is like, I've been harping on the pick and pop. It's always open. It's literally always open. The only time it's ever not open is if teams don't run a traditional coverage, like if they switch or if they rotate from the weak side. And if they rotate from the weak side, you have easy kickout passes for threes. And if they switch, that's where you can get mismatches that you can look to attack, especially when you have uh, the type of talent that Victor Wimbanyama is, right? But like uh, when you pick and pop against a traditional screening coverage, meaning like the big sets the screen, the guard comes off and the big pops to the top of the key, he's always open. It's literally always open because of the assignments of the defenders. The guard is chasing over the top. He's staying attached to the ball handler. The big man is dropping and containing the ball handler. So if the big slips out of the screen to the top of the key, he is literally always open. And that's why I love that action so much for centers. That's what Carl Anthony Towns has been doing so well with the Sixers, which we'll talk about last night in the Laker game. Anthony Davis, once again, pick and pop. Just It's just literally always open. And so if you have a guy who's willing and able to take and make that shot, it's such a, a, a thing that opens up things for your offense. And then trailing and transitions, another big one I've talked about. I'll show you guys an example in the film session with Carl Towns. But he did. Uh, Victor did a lot of that last night, like trailing the play, catching at 25 feet, and then just rising and shooting. But the reality is, is... You can't do anything with Wemby if he's making his jump shot. The action's cool, and he gets open, sure, but like, it doesn't matter if he's open or not because the release point is too high. And then at this point, too, when you when you start hitting the way Victor's been over the last couple of games, guys start chasing him off the line. Now he can drive closeouts. He had a bunch of baskets driving closeouts for like dunks and stuff last night. This goes to the stuff I've been talking about with Nikola Jokic all season, like the big man shooting threes. You want to know what else bigs don't do? Remember when we talked about the inverted ball screens and how big guys can struggle to navigate screening actions? You know what else big guys suck at? Closing out. Because you know what? When they were kids, they weren't closing out often to the three-point line. Most of the time, they're containing, working more about like helping behind on the back line in the paint, right? So guess what? There's going to be a lot of opportunity for Victor Wembanyama with the Alex Sar types of the world sprinting out at him to beat them off the dribble and to get dribble penetration that way. Victor had just six points in the first 10 games of the season out of spot-up situations. He had 14 in the last two games. And again, they're not all just catch-and-shoot threes. There's a lot of those that are driving closeouts. And so like with how how high his release point is, I, I, I just think this is really fascinating. This is an interesting trend that I'm seeing around the league. Really athletically gifted um uh athletes that are investing in the jump shot as their foundation i, I put down five examples victor Wembanyama, jason tatum anthony edwards jalen green in houston De'Aaron fox in sacramento these are guys that are apex athletes in one way or another victor with his insane length and mobility for his size tatum with that combination of size and strength 
Ant is like freaky athletic and strong. Jalen Green, freaky athletic. De'Aaron Fox, potentially the fastest player in the league. These are guys that have insane physical traits that should, in theory, be weaponized more aggressively towards the basket. And all of those guys are taking more than 10 jump shots a game. Ant's taking over 14. Tatum's taking over 13. They're taking tons and tons of jump shots. And I think this is really, really fascinating. It's an interesting trend that we're seeing around the league that these young, freaky athletic players are investing so uh, so heavily into the jump shot as their foundational skill. And again, I think it mostly comes down to the analytic side of things. It's hard to argue with the results. I mean, Victor Weminyama got 24 points at the three-point line last night on 16 attempts. There's a point where the math comes into your favor. Like, like Ant had a really bad jump shooting game last night, but like over the course of the season, the jump shot is Ant taking a jump shot has been one of the most efficient shots that the Minnesota Timberwolves can get this season in any type type of situation. And so again, there's a conversation to be had about like, okay, well, what about when we get into the small sample size and like all these dudes are taking threes and they can they can go, you know, again, like the, like there's a sixty ish percent chance that you're going to miss a shot like that. In a big situation, uh, in a big situation at the end of the game, and there's a complicated conversation to be had about that. And yes, I do think these players need balance for that reason. But I've seen a lot of it. Like Tatum's working a lot closer uh, to the basket, attacking mismatches in the mid range at certain points in the games this year. I've seen Victor Wembanyama do it when he needs to. These guys can do it. I just think it's really interesting that these players are investing so much in the jump shot as a foundational skill uh, for them in the regular season. Victor's starting to get it going. First nine games, 18 points and 10 rebounds on 41% from the field, 23% from three. His last three games, 36 and 12 on 59% from the field, 54% from three. And the Spurs have won five out of eight and are up to six and six in the Western Conference. Man, there are a lot of good teams out West. The Emirates NBA Cup is here, and you can win big getting in on the action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All 30 teams split into six groups every Tuesday and Friday, playing for the right to advance in the single elimination in-season tourney, culminating in the NBA Cup Championship in Vegas. Get behind your favorite players and the prop bets you can make on DraftKings, the best place to bet NBA player props. Ready to place your first bet? Try betting on something simple, like picking how many points your favorite player will have. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app and make your pick. The current favorite to win the NBA Cup is Boston at plus 425, with the Cleveland Cavaliers in second place at plus 850. First time, here's something special just for you. New DraftKings customers bet $5 to get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Score big with DraftKings Sportsbook. Every point counts. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code HOOPS. That's code HOOPS, H-O-O-P-S, for new customers to get $200 in bonus bets when you bet just 5 bucks. Only on DraftKings, the crown is yours. All right, let's be real. There's a food you're probably eating right now that's killing your testosterone, draining your energy, and wrecking your focus and sex drive. And the crazy part, the food is advertised as healthy. Tons of guys are eating it every day because they think it'll help them burn fat and build muscle. But here's the shocking truth. It's doing the exact opposite. Even if you only eat this food every once in a while, it's enough to devastate your testosterone, leaving you feeling weaker, more unmotivated, and struggling in the gym, at work, or even in the bedroom. And trust me, it's not just your age or genetics holding you back. It's this one unexpected food. Here's the thing. This food is so common that most guys don't even realize how much damage it's causing. But there's a simple way to avoid it. And our friends at V-Shred have created a powerful video that reveals exactly what this healthy food is, this healthy food, and how cutting it out can transform your body, helping you build muscle, lose fat, and boost your energy. So if you want to know what this testosterone-killing food is and how to avoid it, head over to SculptNation.com slash hoops. Again, that's SculptNation.com slash hoops to watch the video or to click on the link below. This could be the game changer you've been looking for. Trust me, you won't want to miss this. Number three from our five great performances last night, Jason Tatum, 36 points, nine rebounds and 10 assists. A lot of the same stuff that he's been doing all year. He had 12 points in like straight ISO situations. That's the most he's had in a game since the Knicks game on uh, opening night. He's becoming so great at using his super strong upper body to win leverage battles, to get dribble penetration. And then he's getting defenders out of position and drawing a lot of fouls. He drew two more fouls in ISO situations last night. And then the jump shot just continues to go in at a high clip, 21 of his 36 points last night came on jump shots. 
He's getting 1.09 points per jump shot for the whole season. That's up from last year. 1.33 points per catch and shoot jump shot. That's insane. The big one there is he's he's doing uh, what I call like a delayed closeout shot where, and this this almost exclusively works for taller players, but like it's where a lot of times when guys close out, they will close out hands high, but then they'll sit low when they get there. And there's like a little bit of like a hesitation as the defender goes shot first, then worry about the drive, right? And one of the things you'll see Tatum do is he'll catch on the perimeter and actually like let the dude close out, but then like look down as if he's going to drive and then he'll just rise up into that jump shot. So it's like it's like a catch and shoot with just the slightest hesitation on the catch that lets the defender sit low in a stance thinking he's going to drive for a second and it turns into a little bit of a delayed hand up on the shot. And as a result, he's hitting a lot of contested catch and shoot jump shots this year. As a matter of fact, he's hitting 50% of his uh, guarded catch and shoot jump shots this year. And I think that's a super interesting element of like um, turning like spot up situations that aren't necessarily the highest quality spot up situations into points anyway by weaponizing his height and using that hesitation to get the defender to sit down into his stance. Still only getting 0.96 points per off the dribble jump shot, but I've maintained all season. I do believe that Tatum, I, I just think he's a much better jump shooter than he showed last year. And I just think that, I think that even what we've seen to start this year isn't close to what he's going to be. I think he's going to probably finish the year closer to like 1.15 points per jump shot overall and 1.05 points per off the dribble jump shot. Let's keep an eye on it, but that's kind of where I see the season ending for him. I just think, I still think he's not hitting at the way that he's going to over the course of this season. But I want to dig into the playmaking for a bit. Uh, 10 assists last night. He's averaging a career high 5.6 assists per game, six or more assists in each of the last four games. And he's doing it every which way. He's doing a lot of like passing fulcrum stuff for off ball action. We're seeing a lot of this from stars around the league right now. And a lot of teams are using their center for this as well. But like he'll be the hub while like Derek White's coming off of a screening action. He's hitting him with the pass right away. Or like they'll run action to try to get Jalen Brown a post up matchup that they like right in front of the rim. And like the Tatum will either like make a nice post entry or like the guy will try to front Jalen Brown. And then Tatum will throw like a really nice over the top pass. Tatum had a really nice over the top feed to Jalen Brown last night. Uh, for instance, right? So a lot of like off ball passing fulcrum stuff. Short roll passing is a big one, like screening for the guards, but screening on the inside so we can get inside position and just throwing that hand up, ball comes over the top. And then they just form these like three on twos on the baseline, usually where there's like shooter in the corner, shooter in the corner, and like Nimi Queta just sitting under the basket for a lob. And then there's usually like one guy steps up and then there's like two guys kind of splitting the difference there. And then Tatum has to make the read. If one of them sinks in, on the lob, then he's got to throw the corner pass. Or if he stays out in the corner, he's got to throw the lob pass. And he's just gotten really good at making those reads. And then lastly, whipping kickout passes on drives. And he had a, a couple of really nice ones last night, a skip pass in a ball screen, like a two hand over the uh, top cross court pass to Jalen Brown in the right corner that went in. He had another one where he drove along the baseline and just whipped a right-handed pass beautifully to a relocating Sam Hauser, who was kind of looping around to the top of the key. A lot of the same stuff that I talked about from uh, Giannis, where it's like a, a lot of the best playmakers in the world, they supplement their you know playmaking with like four or five like really simple, easy reads a game, like just a, a smart kick ahead in transition to a guy that has an advantage. Now he's getting a three or a layup or a swing pass when a guy's digging too much down into nail help. A lot of those simple things that supplement uh, th those playmaking numbers. But again, I think he's gone up a level in a real way as a playmaker this year. Tatum's off to a great start. Another great game for him last night. Number four, Carl Anthony Towns. Crazy game between the Bulls and the Knicks. The Bulls jumped him, went up by 22 in the late third quarter. Uh, Zach Levine is sneaky looking kind of good this year. Uh, I'm really curious to see if there's a team that talks themselves into Levine being a legitimate trade target. I would still be terrified because, one, he makes so much money that you have to put out a lot of contracts that could be quality role players to try to get someone like Levine. And then the health risk to me is still just too big for uh, the type of risk that that would be. But who knows? You might be able to get Zach Levine without having to give up draft compensation. And so I wouldn't be surprised if there's some team that talks themselves into it, especially a team that has a large contract or two that they can afford to get rid of. Uh, but Zach Levine looks kind of uh, spunky this year. That's a, a, an interesting trend coming out of Chicago. But the Bulls jump them. They go up 22 in the late third quarter. The Knicks battle back really fast with this crazy late third quarter run. And then it turns into this back and forth dogfight in the fourth quarter. 
Jalen Brunson hits a little mid-range jump shot that should have been the game winner, but then Josh Hart trying to get a rear view contest on Kobe White ends up fouling him. I, I was talking about this with Paul, our, our producer. He's a, a huge Knicks fan earlier this morning. And like, you know, I I understand that the 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 want to make someone feel uncomfortable in a situation like that, but like you got to be so careful in those situations because guys flop. And I don't like this, but NBA officials, for whatever reason, seem hell bent on like micro analyzing three point attempts when it's a, on a, a last second possession. There's just so many iffy calls that get made in those situations, and so like you got to be very very careful in those situations. And Josh Hart just took it a little too close and picked up a foul. And then the Bulls hit three free throws. And then Jalen Brunson got a decent look on a little left shoulder fade, but it literally went as close to going in as it possibly could without going in and it pops out and the Knicks end up getting a loss. But Carl Anthony Towns finished with 46 points and 10 rebounds. It's his second 40 point game of the year. It's his fifth 30 point game of the year. He's averaging a career high 27 points per game, a career best 65% true shooting. He was absolutely barbecuing Nikola Vucevic last night, especially on closeouts, just driving right by him and getting to the basket. But he was also torching him, um, just like facing up, hitting jump shots, beating him as the trailer and transition. A lot of pick and pop stuff like we talked about. I've got a couple examples I'm going to show you guys in the film, uh, not from that game, but from a, uh, the game against Philly on Tuesday. He is uh, He had 24 points in the Bulls game just on spot ups and rolls. Here's what's crazy. Carl Anthony Towns has been converting Rolls and spot ups, both over 1.5 points per possession to start the year. It's been a huge part of the Knicks offense to start. We will get a little bit further into that in the film session. And last but not least, for our five big performances from last night, LeBron James, 35 points, 12 rebounds, 14 assists for the guy who turns 40 in a month. I a couple of weeks ago I was talking about the Lakers um after they had a couple of bad losses in a row on the road trip. And one of the things I said was like, yeah, LeBron hasn't been too good to start this year. And when the Lakers come out flat like they had on the road in a lot of those games, like it certainly is going to manifest in uh like a lot of issues that LeBron can exacerbate when he's not playing as hard as he's capable of playing or when he doesn't have the athletic juice that he's capable of having. But what I said in that situation was he's not the one I'm worried about. LeBron is just such a smart player and such a competitive player that no matter what's going on with him, I always feel like he's going to find a way to get to a really, really high level of impact. He's never been the one that I'm worried about. Well, LeBron's last seven games, 27 points, nine rebounds, 10 assists on 57% from the field, 50% from three, 84% from the line, that's 68% in true shooting percentage. So LeBron's putting up MVP numbers now over the course of the last two weeks. That didn't take long for him to get back up to speed. Again, he's never the one I'm worried about. What Am I worried about D'Lo sometimes? Yes. Am I worried about Rui sometimes? Am I worried about Gabe? Am I worried about a lot of different guys on the Laker roster? Absolutely. But LeBron and AD, I just trust them to be at the level they need to be at. That's why I I look at this team as such a a trade candidate because like the foundation has been so rock solid since January of of this year in 2024 that I feel like it has to be invested in at some point. LeBron's shot creation data has been insane. LeBron has been the best pick and roll player in the league to start the year. He's getting 1.30 points per pick and roll, including passes. That's number one in the league by a mile among the 40 players that have run at least 100 pick and rolls this year. So among those high volume pick and roll players, he's been the best by a lot. The guy in second place is like nine one hundredths of a point behind almost a full 10th of a point behind him. He's at 1.10 points per ISO, including passes. That's seventh among the 19 players to run at least 50. And he's at 1.09 points per post up, which is fifth among the 15 players to run at least 40. So LeBron just has completely turned his season around, just like just like we talked about with Jokic and the Nuggets. LeBron has completely turned his season around over the course of the last few weeks and is playing, once again, at that superstar level, which is what the Lakers have needed out of him so badly. How his jump shot continues to be deadly. He's at 1.21 points per jump shot this year, but especially off the dribble. He's getting 1.21 off the catch, but he's also getting 1.21 points per off the dribble jump shot. He's off to his best pull-up shooting start of his career. 
bullying smaller players. He was torching Jalen Wells last night, who got the LeBron matchup from the opening tip for the injured Memphis Grizzlies team. And then one of the other big things that's really turned things around, uh, or I shouldn't say turned things around, but like that has been different this year for the LeBron and the Lakers compared to last year, is we saw a lot more of what I begged for this summer. If you guys remember from the Olympics, LeBron operated a lot as that passing fulcrum for the top of the key as off-ball action was happening around him. And in those situations, LeBron is able to conserve his legs but weaponize his brain on the offensive end of the floor. I in my Go listen to the season preview that I did for the Lakers before the year. This was something I begged for. Take the lesson from the Olympics. LeBron chills athletically for extensive stretches in the regular season, but mentally he is still incredibly locked in as a competitor one of the highest basketball IQ guys in the league and one of the top two or three passers in the league. So if you put him at the top of the key and you put the ball in his hands and you have everybody running action around him, he can make the reads to either one, make the kill pass. So like a guy gets open on a cut and he's going to hit him for a layup or a guy get breaks open at the three-point line, he's going to hit him for a shot. But at the very least, LeBron will set up the other offensive players for the Lakers with advantage situations, opportunities to drive closeouts, opportunities with the defenders sprinting at them instead of geared up on them with ball pressure, which again, this has been an issue. We're going to talk about it in a minute with the Lakers, but the Lakers have struggled with ball pressure consistently this year, consistently for a couple of years now. If you can have LeBron operate and let D'Lo and Austin, these guys that can struggle with pressure, move around off the ball, and maybe get a catch for the defender sprinting at them instead of hand-checking them full court, they're going to have better opportunities to score that way. And that's been a huge part of how LeBron, like that's been a huge part of what's made this offense work this year is they're using LeBron in a way that makes sense for his age. He can pick his spots and be aggressive. He had his plays where he looked to bully last night. He had his plays where he looked to slash last night. But for the most part, it's knocking down jump shots and operating as a passing fulcrum from the top of the key, which weaponized LeBron's skills that he will bring every night as opposed to relying on the skills that are very dependent on how his legs are feeling on any given night or how hard he feels like playing on any given night. I think it's been a really smart approach from the Lakers this year and something I've been calling for all summer. Uh, on the Lakers front, big picture, they've won three in a row uh, against some bad teams since their bad road trip. So the season has basically come down to they're undefeated at home. In, in the home games, they've beat three good teams and three bad teams. And then they had an abysmal road trip and that leaves them sitting at seven and four. So like, it's weird because if you told me if, uh, looking at their schedule and they've played one of the harder schedules in the league to start the year, if you told me looking at their schedule, like they're going to be seven and four through 11 games, you would think that I'd be higher on them than I was to start the year. But I'm kind of in a weird spot with the Lakers because I'm actually lower on them than I was to start the season because of that lack of speed. I think there's been so much that I've learned. I've talked so much about the concept of like ground coverage and covering ground in rotation, ground, covering ground in transition, the all the elements that speed bring to the table, dribble penetration, all that kind of stuff. Another big one is like, hey, you got to double team these best players in the league. It's like the only thing you can do. And so if you can successfully double team but rotate out of it, then you can you can get away with getting the ball out of the star's hands while still forcing lesser players to take contested shots. But the only way you can do that is if you have the requisite amount of speed in the lineup to cover the ground you need to get out of those double teams. Looking at like a team like the Warriors against the Celtics, usually putting two on the ball against Tatum is an absolute death sentence. But if you have the speed to recover out of it, you can still bog things down in those situations. And so I my my kind of like influx of appreciation or understanding or whatever you want to call it of the way that speed, excuse me, leads to success in the NBA. That specifically has caused me to be lower on the Lakers, despite the fact that they've been seven and four, because they still just have too many stretches where basically this is what happens with the Lakers. If LeBron and AD don't engage themselves athletically, like the, what they, like what they did in the fourth quarter last night, if they don't do that, the team looks dreadfully unathletic. Because LeBron and AD are the athletes. LeBron and AD are the guys that bring that for this group. So there are stretches last night where, you know, maybe LeBron's not battling on the glass as hard or AD's not super engaged. And then they just get absolutely mauled on the offensive glass. They gave up 34 more points in transition last night. They've been basically the worst transition defense in the league. Like whenever LeBron and AD aren't engaged athletically, the rest of the team looks dreadfully slow and the wheels fall off. 
Ball pressure continues to bog down their guards every single time. Their guards can't beat it off the dribble and actually create penetration off of it. They struggle with it, right? But then when LeBron and AD engage themselves, they, they, they look like a real basketball team because they can cover for some of the athletic limitations of their team. But so many of these games are coming down to LeBron and AD flexing their individual muscles to regain control of these games. And last night was such a great example of that. And I think that's a dangerous build for a team that has an older star in LeBron James at age 39. If there was more athleticism to balance out the skill among, because the role players have a lot of skill. Rui is skilled. Austin is skilled. D'Lo is skilled. Dalton Connect is skilled. They have a lot of skill in their role player core, but there's not a lot of athleticism there. If they had more athleticism to balance out the skill among the role players, then they wouldn't have to rely on their stars to leverage their athletic gifts as much as they do. So that's why I'm in a weird spot, because on one hand, I'm lower on them than I was to start the year. But on the other hand, I'm also optimistic in the sense that like, if they hit on a trade and if they get Jared Vanderbilt back and they become a faster team, I still love the LeBron and AD uh, duo at the top. Austin Reeves, once again, hit just a ridiculous step back three on the left wing last night that ended up being one of the more important shots in the game. Austin's a hooper. He's a gamer. I count on that guy to make plays. They just need athleticism. And so I'm lower on them. But if they can supplement that athleticism at some point during the season, all of a sudden they become a very interesting and dangerous team, in my opinion. Uh, I do love the AD shooting element. This is the second game last night where he uh, AD basically closed the game, popping to the three-point line. Love that he's confident in those situations. I think it's such an important thing for them to lean on because one, like I talked about earlier in the show, it is always open. The pick and pop is always open. And two, like make things easier on yourself. Once you start uh, when AD is constantly rolling and not popping, it just gets kind of complicated with the spacing and it makes life more difficult for everybody. AD being willing to pop, especially if he continues to hit him over the large sample, that could be something that continues to open up those off-ball actions for the guards to get to work and for more uh, opportunities to cut into the paint, uh, the painted area. All right, let's uh, get into our film session and then we'll be out of here for the day. All right, so we are starting... We are starting with the uh, Philly Knicks game from Tuesday night. So this is an example of uh, trailing bigs in transition. So again, this is where we're working against the instincts of a big. Joel Embiid is the guy guarding Carl Anthony Towns. Watch the way he runs down the floor. He's thinking transition defense like a big, right? So he's going to sink into the paint or into the uh, well inside the arc. When he catches, he's like, look at him. He's like, oh, shit. Because he forgets that Carl Anthony Towns is willing to shoot out here. But it's his natural instinct. His natural instinct is to drop into this area in transition. And Cat's able to just kind of settle into an easy trailing three. It's one of the big ways that Cat's been burning bigs around the league to start this year. Is transition trailing action. Here's the, uh, the action that I've been seeing all around the league this year. Which is like, let's put our center at the top of the key and let's throw him the ball. So let's do that first. Here's a high post entry. And then basically what you do is you have your two guards up top screen for each other. So in this case, Brunson for Bridges. That puts uh, Kelly Oubre into trail position. Now Mikhail Bridges sprints. Oubre's still in trail position. So now Carl Anthony Towns, because he can shoot, has Embiid right up on him. And Bridges is going to come right down into this area, right? There's that over-the-top pass as Kelly's in trail position. Now we have our three-on-two. Bam. Here's our three-on-two, right? And here's the thing, Lowry actually steps up, and technically he could have thrown this kickout pass to OG, but Lowry's small, so Mikael Bridges is like, screw it, I'm just going to go up with this. And he does, and he gets a layup. That's the type of action that I'm seeing all the way around the league to start this year, and I think it's just such a smart approach to using your center and creating space underneath the basket. Uh, this is one of the things I talked about in the uh, the show on Tuesday night where like Nick Nurse has been having in these ball screens, just having Embiid stay glued on Cat. So basically, here's our ball screen, right? We have our ball screen, and Embiid, instead of dropping, look at him. He's just staying attached. Why? Because Cat's wide open on the damn uh, pop every single time. Then they're forcing the help from an off-ball perimeter player, right? So now as Brunson's going downhill, Paul George is basically functioning as the drop player, right? He's functioning as the drop big where Embiid would typically be here. These guys would all be matched up and then Carl Anthony Towns would be wide open. Instead, they're having Embiid stay home. Paul George helps. 
That forces Kyle Lowry to sink down on Josh Hart. Now we have our kickout pass. Here's our closeout. We got our closeout, pump fake, one dribble, two dribble pull up. Nice and easy shot for OG and Anobi. So that, like, that's the thing. It's, it's just really difficult to guard that pick and pop because if you guard it the way that the Sixers did, you're going to end up causing other problems elsewhere in your defense. All right, let's get into the end of that Warriors-Mavs classic from Tuesday night. I was talking in the post-game show about how like guys just keep making big plays. I thought this was a random one last night. So we have a transition cross match here, right? So transition defense, everyone grabs the nearest man. It's less about matchups and it's more just grabbing the nearest man. You basically, in transition defense, it's stop the ball, guard the basket, then just get matched up regardless of who you're guarding. And so that puts lively on Buddy Heald. So then uh, Buddy Heel gets the ball and actually hits a really nice, look at this dribble combination. I'm going to slow it down a bit. Look at this dribble combination on Lively. Between the legs, left-handed crossover back to the right, gets him off the dribble. And then that little step, look at the little gather step that he takes into Lively's space. If he just goes straight to the rim, Lively's the superior athlete and he's going to beat him up top. But watch, I'm going to slow it down even further. Watch the step that he takes into the lane right on his gather, right here, watch. Look how he gathers in, right there, into Lively's space to make it so that Lively can't just go straight beeline to the rim. Then he extends out and takes the layup. Really savvy basketball from Buddy Heald. Big bucket in that game. This was some of the things I was talking about in the uh, post game too, about Moses Moody overhelping in a ball screen. So like Moody's way in the paint here early in the possession. It's just an easy skip pass to Clay Thompson on the opposite side. But that's kind of one of those things too, where I was talking about with the Mavs with their spacing. If they situate it so that the, the low man is obviously coming off of Clay, they can generate a lot of those skip passes for him. Luca had a really rough defensive night. Uh, this was a classic example of that. Watch as uh, Steph is running through. We're going to get a ball screen first. Buddy drives. Here's the Steph cut. Okay. So we have Quinn Grimes on Steph. We have Luca on Moody. Watch Luca this whole possession. Just stands there. And again, like, look, there's all they're doing is slipping this screen. And like Quentin Grimes is chasing and Luca's just standing and Moody just slips right behind him. Now, again, you could argue that's supposed to be a switch, but let's say it's a switch. Luca's not ready for Steph either. He's too flat footed. He's not in position to do anything. Even if he switches that, Steph's running off of Draymond and getting another uh, an open three. He's got to be lower in a stance, active, ready to move. And Moody just ends up getting an easy dunk. Again, Steph Gravity he does that to a lot of people. But if you're going to guard that properly, you need both defenders 100% engaged. This, I thought, oh, was a, 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 a really interesting ISO bucket for Clay against Andrew Wiggins. So straight ISO against an elite defender, but a simple action gets him, uh, gets him the, the bucket. So first, let's watch it full speed, and then I'll show you what I noticed in the slowdown, which was super fascinating. So Clay's going to just drive, pump fake and drive past Wiggins and get all the way to the basket. So Wiggins should, in theory, be athletic enough to show a little bit on a pump fake and not get toasted. But what I want you to watch is his right foot. In order to push off your right foot, it's got to be planted on the ground. If it's in the air, you're not pushing anything off, right? So watch Wiggins' right foot on the pump fake. So we get to the ISO. Let me fast forward a little bit. Here's our ISO. Watch the pump fake. Watch Wiggins' right foot. So he's planted. So if Wiggins were to, if Clay were to rip to the right now, Wiggins would be able to easily push off of this foot and beat him to the spot. But watch as Clay pump fakes his right foot come off the ground. Watch. So when his right foot comes off the ground, he loses his leverage in that spot. And look at how often his right foot comes off the ground. It comes off the ground three times. Watch on the pump fake. Once, twice, three times. And so as a result, his weight isn't on that right leg. And you can literally see as he tries to push. Watch as Wiggins tries to push. He has to actually drag himself with his left leg rather than push with his right. And that makes him slow. Watch right here. Right there. See, there's no weight on that leg. So now he's dragging himself with his left leg to try to recover. And then he finally gets a plant with his right foot there. 
to try to recover and he's dead to rights. So such an interesting example of how a pump fake, just a simple pump fake, got Clay just barely enough of a leverage advantage to beat a much faster player off the dribble. Really fascinating little uh, example of basketball um, fundamentals. This I thought was an interesting example of Steph's gravity that goes under the radar a lot of the time. So Steph's working in ISO against Grimes and gets to a step back, but watch as the action is happening. Watch Gafford. Gafford is ignoring Looney to basically offer a soft double. He's not double teaming Steph, but he's making it so that if Steph drives past Grimes, he's running right into Gafford. Notice, gra- uh, notice from the beginning, I'm going to play the whole thing. Notice from the beginning, Gafford never actually drops to Looney. He's on. Steph the whole time, right? Then he looks to Looney. So what's the problem here? Yeah, you forced Steph into a jump shot, but you gifted Looney inside position. Looney's able to easily box out. And now that Looney has inside position, he's able to get the easy offensive rebound put back. I think he just draws a foul on this one. But yeah, again, so like that's an example of Steph's gravity that won't show up in the box score for him as anything positive. It's a missed shot. But he basically gave Looney easy offensive rebound position because he was gathering Gafford into help. This, I thought, was the biggest play of the game last uh, the Tuesday night that went completely under the radar. It's 112-105 with four minutes left. The Mavs are up seven. This thing looks like it's close to over. Luka has Steph in a, mis- a mismatch in the middle of the floor. Watch Steph. Pokes the ball away, gets a steal from Luca in the mismatch, sprints down the floor. In the ensuing chaos, we'll speed up a little bit. In the ensuing chaos, DeAnthony Melton gets a wide open three. Big time shot for DeAnthony, too. But that changed the complexion of the game. Now it's 112 108. It's 112 108 now instead of 112 105. Completely changed the game. And that was a mismatch that could have been a bucket for Dallas. Huge defensive play from Steph Curry. This was just an insane shot that Steph Curry hit against Quentin Grimes. Again, one of the biggest things that I took away from this game, above and beyond anything else going on with the Warriors, is Steph just looks great. He, like, like I said, I looked at the end of last year as a slump. I expected him to have a bounce-back year, having a big-time bounce-back year. Look at this superstar move against Quentin Grimes. Rip through over the top, step back, get enough separation, knock it down. This was another play where I thought Steph... So they ran a lot of this action last night where they would run an initial screen to get Luka onto Steph. So they get they run the initial screen to get Luka onto Steph, then they bring Gafford up into the screen. This was the action they spammed down the stretch. But again, this is bad defense from Luka. So you know there's a switch coming. I get it. You know there's a switch coming. But this is too soft of a switch on both ends. Watch Luka just go, okay... You go ahead, Steph. See how he just quits? Luca just says, you got it, Steph. And then Gafford's too far back, and Steph just settles into the gap between them and takes the shot. At the very least, if you're Luca, you've got to stay attached with Steph up until the moment that Gafford is there. Luca was gifting Steph the transition between the switch, and Steph burned him. Uh, like, Luka, but look at, again, all these things. Technically, there's an explanation. Okay, Luca was switching. Or the slip from from uh, Moody. Okay, Luca was expecting to switch out onto Clay in the corner. I'm not debating that. The problem is it's not about what he's doing. It's about the fact that he's not actually actively, athletically engaged in the game on defense. He is sitting and doing the bare minimum. And that is what teams are capitalizing on at the end of these games and hunting him for. And they're getting buckets. And it's costing the Mavs games. It's a real problem. It's something that it co- uh, continues to be a problem extending from last year in the finals. This was crazy. This defensive play from Draymond. Look at how he's able to offer high help. So he's helping around this free throw line area and able to, while offering that high help, recover to Gafford at the basket. Notice once again, Gafford too goes up with two hands. Draymond leads with his left hand first. Watch. Leads with his left, but then he sees Gafford double pump, and as soon as he double pumps, he switches to his right hand and goes after the exposed ball. Really, really high-level defensive play from Draymond. Takes a little moment to talk his shit. And these things are all connected, guys, because like here's the very next possession. Watch this. 
Draymond, Draymond is once again a little too high, and Gafford is behind him. But the fear of Draymond in his wingspan and his instincts causes Clay Thompson to overcook this pass too high. He throws it too high because Draymond is the issue there. If if, he, if Draymond's not there, if it's anybody else, you throw a lower pass. Here we go with this same exact uh, action that I was talking about earlier. We get the Wiggins screen to get Luka switched onto Steph. Then we're going to run into the ball screen. This is just embarrassing defense from Luka. Steph just literally just does a simple double cross and just goes right around Luka easily to the basket. Toasts him off the dribble and gets an and one on the scoop shot. Just every time down the floor, they're going at him. Every time down the floor. This was the biggest stop of the game, in my opinion. Look at the defense from Wiggins on Luka. I talked a lot on Tuesday night's show about Luka's ability to absorb body blows from Luka without getting completely dislodged and actually knocking Luka a little off balance. This one right here, that blow, he just absorbs the blow. You can look at this last one here, this last bump, boom. Notice on that last bump, Luka doesn't gain any additional space right here. Not this one, the next one. Ready? Right here. Luca holds him off, and now it turns into this one-legged fadeaway from 15 feet. Again, we all know that's a shot Luca can take and make, but he's forcing him into the lowest efficiency shot that Luca takes, which is the contested long two. And then, in this case, we get the exact same sequence. Wigan screen, get Luca switch. This time, Steph uses the screen. Switch on to Lively, beats him with that little left to right crossover. Boom. Game over. Fun fun game from the Warriors there on Tuesday night. All right, I just wanted to show you guys a couple of examples of inverted ball screens uh, that Giannis was running. Once again, I talked about how big guys just struggle to identify and navigate screens. Watch Isaiah Stewart here. Just watch him, watch his head. He's like, is he over here? Wait, 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 no. Is he on the left side? Wait, where is he? Oh, wait, no, he's on the other side. Now Giannis is dunking. Look at look at how all Pat Connaughton had to do was fake that he was running to set a screen on the right and then switch and set it on the left, and it got Isaiah Stewart out of position. The other thing, too, look at Cade Cunningham on the hedge. So Connaughton fakes like he's setting the screen on the right side. That makes Cade think, oh, my hedge is over here. So Cade goes to hedge, but uh, Pat actually sets the screen on the opposite side. Uh, Cade's hedge is actually supposed to be over here. It's not. Now Pat effectively can screen both guys and then uh, Giannis gets the dunk. But again, it's all about putting guys into positions that they're not normally in. Exact same thing here with Jalen Duran. Watch the uh, watch the flip of the screen, this time with Connaughton. Again, fakes like he's going to set it on the left side, causes the hedge on the left side, but then turns and screens the opposite side and Giannis is able to get downhill easily. All about putting people in roles that they're not typically in. All right. Get back to our full screen here. All right, guys. That is all I have for today. As always, I sincerely appreciate you for supporting me and supporting the show. I'm recording a mailbag later this afternoon that will go up on, uh, I think it's going up on Saturday and Sunday. Again, keep dropping mailbag questions. We're going to get to them on the upcoming Fridays throughout the rest of the season. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting me and supporting the show. And I will see you tomorrow.